Today, we explore the top two horrifying human experiments. Our first stop takes us to Imperial Japan during the Second World War and involves a secret biological research facility. This facility was dubbed the covert name Unit 731 and was responsible for subjecting its victims to unimaginable horrors such as frostbite, lethal infections, and experimental weapon testing. Our second case brings us to Macon County, Alabama, where starting in 1932, researchers, including those from the United States Public Health Service, experimented on African-American men using a sexually transmitted disease. Every week, we count down the top two true crimes or dark stories from around the world. Be sure to subscribe to our channel to catch the latest episode each week. Now join us as we count down the top two horrifying human experiments. Number one, Unit 731. Led by the infamous Shiro Ishii, a former combat medical officer, Unit 731 was established by the Imperial Japanese Army in the early 1930s. The horrible experiments conducted within its walls were aimed at advancing Japan's biological and chemical warfare capabilities during World War II. The victims, numbering in the hundreds of thousands, were often referred to simply as logs. This term was meant to not only dehumanize them and justify the unspeakable acts that were committed, but also used by the staff in reference that the unit was simply a lumber mill of human bodies. Unit 731 was previously known as Zongma Fortress, which also had its own sinister past and was nestled near the mountains of what's now Pingfeng, China. It was unknown to many at the time since the Japanese government simply referred to it as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department. Shiro Ishii was given full power to assemble his sinister team for this unit, and at its peak included over 10,000 personnel, ranging from medical professionals to professors who jumped at a chance to perform real human experiments. One of these medical professionals was a man named Yoshimura Hisato, who was a physiologist assigned to Unit 731. During his service, he became obsessed with the effects of hypothermia, and as a part of his demented study, he would submerge his victim's limbs in water filled with ice. He then forced them to hold this position until their limbs went numb. Then, he'd make them sit until their arms or legs were frozen solid in a sort of giant ice cube. One of the eyewitnesses described the gruesome scene and said that, the limbs sounded like wood when struck with a cane. To make matters worse, Hisato also experimented with methods to rewarm the frozen body parts. Sometimes he dipped them in hot water, and at other times he held it close to an open fire or left the subject overnight to see how long it took for the blood to thaw it out. Surprisingly, after the war was over, Hisato was able to obtain war crime immunity and even later went on to become a president of a university. As Unit 731's macabre experiments expanded, the number of test subjects among Army soldiers began to dwindle, prompting the involuntary recruitment of innocent civilians. It was at this time that research subjects were starting to be referred to as logs, or Maruto in Japanese. Another of Ishii's sinister soldiers who exploited these civilians was a man named Yasuji Kaniko. One of his evil experiments included vivisection, a brutal practice of removing human organs without anesthesia in an attempt to study them in a more natural state. He and his team deliberately infected thousands of subjects with bubonic plague and cholera. Then, after the infection had spread throughout the entire body, the researchers would extract their organs, all while the patients were still alive and in pain. The study of the bubonic plague would play a haunting role in what was later known as the Kaminji germ weapon attack. One can't even imagine the horror these poor souls faced, but this wasn't even the end of it. In an attempt to study the effects of gangrene, 
Some subjects had their limbs amputated and reattached to the other side of their bodies. Others simply had their limbs forcefully crushed or frozen. And when a prisoner's body was fully used up, they were simply killed or injected with a lethal injection. While Unit 731 engaged in its bizarre medical tests, it also went on to study the effects of various weapons on the human body. There's no doubt the Japanese army manufactured many advanced weapons during World War II, and part of the testing of these weapons involved human subjects at Unit 731. Victims were tied to stakes so they couldn't move, and then were fired upon using various weapons, such as rifles, pistols, and even flamethrowers. Similarly, soldiers tested out knives, swords, and bayonets on these poor victims as well. Unit 731 didn't stop there. In attempts to test the human body's limits, researchers even subjected victims to extreme G-forces or starvation. Some of these subjects were strapped into a makeshift centrifuge and then spun at extremely high speeds of 10 to 15 Gs until they lost consciousness or died. The idea was to simulate what might happen to pilots or paratroopers during a plane crash. Other subjects were simply locked up and deprived of food and water for weeks at a time to study how long humans could survive. Reports and witness accounts state that most were only given seawater to quench their thirst and then left to starve in an agonizing death. Non-consensual sex was also a common practice of Unit 731's horrific experiments. Female captives of childbearing age were forcefully impregnated so that weapons and trauma could be tested on them and their unborn children. The pregnant subjects were also infected with various diseases and exposed to chemical weapons. Afterwards, they were dissected so that the effects on the fetuses could also be studied. In the end, Unit 731's sole purpose was to develop weapons of mass destruction to be used against the Chinese, American, and Soviet forces during the war. As a result of their gruesome experiments, Unit 731 teamed up with another covert unit dubbed Unit 1644, decided to unleash the bubonic plague and cholera using bombs. Their hope was that by using biological weapons infected with these diseases, they could quickly depopulate areas inconspicuously. Even more disturbing was their method of cultivating these diseases in preparation for the attacks. In an effort to develop the most lethal strains, prisoners were deliberately infected. Those who survived were terminated, while those with the most severe symptoms had their blood drained and were used to infect the next generation of hosts. This cycle would go on for weeks or months until the pathogens reach a satisfactory death rate. Once satisfied with the lethality, the last generation of victims were fed on by thousands of fleas, causing them to be infected carriers as well. These infected fleas were then packed in dust and sealed inside ceramic bomb casings to be dropped over heavily populated cities. In October of 1940, Japanese bombers unleashed their sinister attack. They deployed bombs loaded with 30,000 fleas over the port of Ningbo in the Chinese province of Zhejiang. Witnesses say a fine reddish dust settled all over town that eventful day, followed by painful flea bites. Estimates put deaths in the thousands from these attacks and caused entire areas to be evacuated and burned. Finally, in August 1945, the Soviet army began to invade the area of Pingfeng, China. Sensing the end, Ishii ordered his men to destroy all evidence, including any prisoners that were still alive. He wanted to completely erase all evidence of what happened at Unit 731 and even went as far as to give his soldiers cyanide if they were captured. However, after the surrender of Japan to the Americans at the end of the war, the truth finally came out. Unfortunately, the US government granted immunity to many of Ishii and Unit 731's henchmen in exchange for the results of these deadly experiments. What happened in Unit 731 would go down in history as truly some of the most horrifying human experiments ever conducted. Number two, the Tuskegee experiment. 
In the 1930s, a period when medical knowledge was still in its infancy, there was a profound lack of understanding surrounding sexually transmitted diseases. The Tuskegee experiment, also known as the syphilis study, emerged as an attempt to fill the gaps in knowledge surrounding the long-term effects of syphilis on the human body. However, the means by which this study was conducted had a dark and sinister side. Syphilis, a bacterial infection transmitted through sexual contact, was a significant public health concern at the time. The According medical community the was grappling with limited society, treatment society, options and an incomplete understanding of the disease's progression. Over drugstore counters from quacks or other unauthorized sources. Enter the United States Public Health Service, who had the intention to conduct a study that would shed light on the natural history of syphilis in African American men. At the onset, the study seemed like a well-intentioned effort to contribute to medical knowledge and address a public health crisis. However, the darker moral compass guiding this research would soon deviate drastically, leading to one of the most horrifying human experiments ever conducted in the United States. So why African-American men? This choice was not only rooted in racial biases, but also in societal power dynamics that allowed for the exploitation of a marginalized group. The researchers likely believed they could conduct the study with less public scrutiny due to the fact that the subjects belonged to a community that already faced discrimination and had limited access to health care. Most of the participants were simple peasant farmers and many of them had never been to the hospital or even seen a doctor before. These men jumped at the chance for free and quality health care, or so they thought. Before 1932, medical treatment was typically reserved for emergencies only, and they assumed these medical professionals would be helping them improve their health for free. Little did these men know, these doctors had targeted them specifically for their race, and their sinister plans were quite the opposite. The initial study consisted of 600 African-American men residing in and around Tuskegee, Alabama. Among them, 399 had unknowingly been injected with syphilis, while 201 were part of a control group. The study's architects sought to observe the natural progression of syphilis over time, withholding the most effective treatment available, penicillin, even as it emerged as a cure for the disease later in the study. As the Tuskegee syphilis study unfolded, the untreated participants faced a painful journey throughout the various stages of the disease, enduring the devastating effects as it progressed unchecked. Syphilis is a bacterial infection that evolves through distinct stages, and without treatment, it can wreak havoc on the body. In the primary stage, the disease manifests as small painful sores or cankers at the site of the infection. And although researchers observed these initial symptoms, they simply lied to the subjects or gave them placebo treatments. They also treated the men using toxic compounds such as arsenic, mercury, and bismuth. As syphilis advances to the secondary stage, symptoms can include skin rashes, horrible mucous membrane lesions, and brutal flu-like symptoms. The participants were left to fend for themselves with these debilitating effects all while believing they were receiving medical care from the United States government. The researchers, however, were merely documenting the natural course of the disease without intervening. The long-term consequences became even more severe in the tertiary stage for these men. Untreated, syphilis eventually begins to affect vital organs, leading to cardiovascular issues, neurological damage, and even death. Some of these men begin to go blind, while others experience issues with basic motor functions as a result of the disease infecting their central nervous system. These men's bodies began shutting down, with some even succumbing to organ failure or going insane due to the disease. Towards the end of this horrifying experiment in 1972, a mere 74 individuals among the study participants remained alive. Within the initial group of 399 men that were infected, 28 had succumbed to the direct effects of syphilis, while an additional 100 had passed away due to the complications related to the disease. Tragically, 
40 of their wives had contracted it as well, and 19 of their children were also born with congenital syphilis. Although the study was undeniably evil, there was a member of the staff who decided to try and put an end to it. Peter Buxton, a former employee of the United States Public Health Service, was assigned to the venereal disease branch in the early 1960s. Disturbed by what horrifying practices he witnessed, Buxton decided to take a stand. He later said in an interview, I didn't want to believe it. This was the public health service. We didn't do things like that. In 1966, he began voicing his concerns to his superiors within the public health service, urging them to halt the study and rectify the ongoing injustices. Buxton attempted to file internal reports multiple times, with all of them being ignored. Finally, he had had enough and decided to leak his concerns to the press. And in 1972, he leaked information about the Tuskegee syphilis study to a reporter, ultimately leading to an expose by the Associated Press. The day after it was initially published, it also made the front page of the New York Times. The revelation sent shockwaves to the nation, sparking public outrage and demanding immediate action. With this publication, the public learned of the deceit, the denial of treatment, and the horrific consequences faced by the participants and their families. The Tuskegee syphilis study, which had operated in the shadows for four decades, was then officially shut down. In 1973, Attorney Fred Gray championed justice on behalf of the victims by filing a class action lawsuit. This legal intervention compelled Congress to take corrective action, leading to a 10 million out of court settlement for the surviving participants and heirs of those who had tragically succumbed. The aftermath of this scandal also prompted the implementation of new guidelines to safeguard the rights of human subjects within research projects. The final participant of the Tuskegee syphilis study passed away in 2004, marking the end of a painful chapter in American medical history. And that's a wrap for today's episode. These were the top two horrifying human experiments. Feel free to leave your comments below and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like it. This is Josh, and thank you for watching Bizarre Legends.